Okay, so that's the title, um, Awele Meuli, Racism Crossing the Moana. And um, I just want to present this uh, talanoa about this problematic term um, in, our, in our context, um, meuli. Um, and the word there, uh, if you break it down, is um, consisted of two words, uh, mea, which means thing, and uh, uli, uh, which means black. So meuli is um, therefore literally a uh, black thing. Um, and and the title Awele Meuli is uh, it, it forms the first bit of lyrics uh, to a popular song here in our culture um, and in our context. Uh, but despite the celebratory uh, notions behind this song, um, this word Meuli um, is probably not worth celebrating um, because literally the word, as we just, uh, just explained, means black thing. But it's the common uh, term that we that is referred uh, for black people. Um, and it's used in um, everyday language. So it's obvious here that the term is dehumanizing and therefore racist towards black people. So in this presentation, I wish to present a Dalanoa or a conversation around this concept um, as one of the many colonial and uh, racist legacies of our past and the role that the church played in instigating such discriminatory and racist perceptions. Uh, in particular, um, I want to explore the role of Samoan missionaries to Melanesian countries such as Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu um, and the, uh, how the racist colonial project was perpetuated through this. Um, and I want to use the Samoan proverb, uh, Malta Tau Ave, which uh, is translated as the house that is carried um, as a framework for re-envisaging uh, the colonial endeavor. Um, it is also essential that in this presentation, and I do so with great respect to offer a biblical ifonga. Um, and this is a, uh, ifonga is a Samoan practice of uh, forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, I'll explain that a little bit um, more um, as we continue, but I want to offer a biblical ifonga um, as opposed to a cultural ifonga um, by offering a, uh, a, a liberating uh, liberation reading of, of um, Song of Songs. So um, before I uh, continue on, um, I want to start uh, with the uh, colonial legacies of the European mission. Um, and the presence of Europeans in the Pacific brought in colonial mindsets that heightened the superiority complex of one race over the other, in this case, of so non-Blacks over Blacks. Um, and the prominence uh, of such a mindset um, among white Europeans could be traced back uh, to as early as the um, medieval age, ages. Um, in Europe, from the beginning of this medieval period, blackness had a host of negative associations, uh, such as death, uh, melancholy, and above all, Satan. Um, and traversing across the oceans and into the Moana, these negative attitudes towards black people ventured with them. Um, and in Samoan terms, we may imagine Europeans bringing their house, their Malta, uh, with them, or as we say, Malta to Avi. Um, the word Malta refers to one's house. And in this phrase or proverb, Malta is a symbol for the collective of one's cultural, social and religious identity. The problem for Pacifica is that the European Malta contained colonial attitudes and notions of superiority, which emanated through the teachings of its missionaries. For instance, the negative associations of black to the ideals um, as listed by that quote from Epstein had been fostered in biblical interpretation, particularly in the story of the curse of Ham. Um, European missionaries had equated the Melanesians with the consequence uh, of, of Ham's curse. In other words, the European attitudes towards blackness spurred out a racist commentary on their dark skin, which in the eyes of European missionaries at least pushed them to a state of inferiority in comparison to other Pacifica peoples, uh, in particular Polynesians. So the European attitude was particular to darkness, while Euro um, Polynesians were seen more favorably. As such, when European Christianity spread to Pacifica, Polynesians, Samoans in particular, uh, became the perfect successors to the European mission. Here, I want to tread back to Malta Tau Ave, as now that Samoans were leaving their shores for others, their cultural notions were to travel with them. Uh, as Fele no Kise states, apart from their adopted Christian convictions, they also took with them their inherent cultural understanding. And here lies the irony of their role. The Christian gospel gave them a religious role. 
their cultural background provided them with a nationalistic one. Now, this nationalistic agenda became a point of colonial oppression by the Samoans because unlike some Polynesians, quote, such as the Cook Islanders, the Samoans were reluctant to adapt to the demands and expectations of other cultures. Their social cohesion led them to believe that their culture was superior, end quote, um, from Nokisi. Uh, Sione Latukefu um, also argues that Samoans had no doubt whatsoever of their physical, mental, and cultural superiority to the Melanesians and tended to look down on others, particularly the Papua New Guineans and Solomon Islanders. The cultural superiority complex would no doubt permeate to the language of mission, and in looking down on others, we may envision the Samoan missionaries calling the proselytized Melanesians Meoli. In perpetuating this racist mindset, readings of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, were shaped in a way that denigrated the Melanesians. As a Hebrew Bible scholar myself, I can't help but feel shame for these readings, which were not built on any word studies or the social setting of the text, but on the platform of inherited discriminatory notions towards black folk. Rather than engaging in dialogue with the culture and language of the lands, these Samoan missionaries planted their own Malta, as the Samoan missionaries indoctrinated the indigenous people with their own understanding of Christianity. Samoan ideas, beliefs, and attitudes, as well as mode of behavior, were regarded as vital and relevant to the evangelization process, um, as stated by Nokisi. As such, the colonial project had perpetuated from Europe to across the Moana. So I want to offer a biblical fonga here. Um, as a Samoan minister of the Congregational Christian Church Samoa, I am a successor of the LMS missionaries. To my Melanesian kinfolk, I offer this hifonga. And hifonga is the is a Samoan form of apology, where the culprit sits on the ground, on the fanua, the land of the offended, covered in an iatonga as depicted in this uh, picture, which is a fine mat, which signals forgiveness of the offenders, uh, sorry, in silence and remorse, leaning on the mercy of the offender to uncover this iatonga, which signals forgiveness of the offender's sin. As such, I sit on the ground on the fanua of my oppressed Melanesian kinfolk, covered in the shame of my predecessors, and offering them this biblical uh, ifonga. Not a token reading of the text, but an acknowledgement of the fallacy of past readings, bringing into light what should have always been there in the past, a reading that seeks to liberate Black people, in particular my Melanesian family. I obviously cannot read the whole, old, the whole Old Testament in this setting, but I bring a text that speaks of love, the Song of Songs. And there's the text um, up on the, uh, on the screen. Um, hopefully you've got some time to, to read that quickly. Um, but the key verse, therefore, for, for us is the first, uh, the verse five, I am black and beautiful, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedah, like the curtains of Solomon. So in this reading, um, the woman's opening statement, I am black and beautiful, in verse 5 is expanded in the canto that we just um, witnessed on the screen to explain her blackness. The Hebrew conjunction, um, vav, is often translated as and, um, but here I've decided to take its other meaning as but. Um, so therefore, it is she is black but beautiful. Given her explanation in trying to justify her blackness, the vav is best translated, therefore, as but, as an indication that despite her blackness, she is beautiful. Scholars have argued that the blackness of the woman refers to her skin complexion and not her ethnicity. Now, this is confirmed in verse 6 as she talks of the, of the sun gazing on her. However, Pacifica people are also people of the sun who exist in warmer and tropical climates and rely on the sun's gaze for growing crops. Why can't she be both black ethnically and as a result of the sun's gaze as Middle Eastern and Pacifica people are. The Daughters of Jerusalem is a title given to the woman's female companions in the poem. Symbolically, they represent the Jewish attitude towards beauty. In the text, as indicated by the woman's self-description in verse 5, the woman responds to the standards of society concerning beauty. Attractive women in Jewish society usually come from a higher class and never have to work outdoors, which means that their skin complexion is light-skinned or white or pale. A dark-skinned woman is indicative of a woman who is poor and from a lower class as she has to work outdoors for a living. 
Yet, in defiance, the woman claims that she is black but also beautiful. In the same manner, Melanesians are black but also beautiful. The woman defends her blackness and advises the daughters of Jerusalem that in spite of her blackness, she is still beautiful. In verse 5, she uses an unusual metaphor to prove a point comparing her blackness to the tents of Kedar. Kedar is a nomadic Arabian tribe who were known for their large tents made of goat skin. These tents were dark colored due to the dark color of the goat hair. The Kedar tents were also known for being strong as they were able to withstand strong desert storms as well as the heat from the sun. The woman, therefore, is comparing not only her skin complexion, but also her physical strength as a result of her outdoor work. In verse 6, we are introduced to the woman's brothers, who are referred to as her mother's sons. They present a symbol of oppression for her as she is made to work outdoors because of them. I acknowledge here that the Samoan missionaries of the past are like the brothers oppressing their Melanesian sister. And finally, the woman is emotionally and psychologically liberated in verse 8 as her companions, the daughters of Jerusalem, tell her to find courage and to go and find her lover. They accept her beauty by referring to her as fairest among women. Samoan missionaries should have been like the daughters of Jerusalem, not imposing their own Samoan mota upon the missionary Melanesians, but encouraging them to build and fortifying their own mota. The brothers had been calling their sister a meuli, but the daughters of Jerusalem liberate her humanity, and to them and to us, she is tangatauli, a black but beautiful human. Now, this reading is built on love and liberation for my Melanesian kin. And while the wrongs of the past can never be correct, my ruminations in the current space must act as a corrective. I don't put the onus, like uh, the former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison did, on the marginalized other to forgive. For that is the choice and right of my Melanesian folk. What I can do is that when I carry my maota to other spaces, I do so acknowledging that my predecessors carried their maota under colonial intentions, and to not repeat the sins of the past. Rather, I must carry my Malta in dialogue with other Malta to recognize and liberate the humanity in others. So that when I traverse the Moana, I see that she is Tangata Uli. She is black but beautiful. She is Melanesian. Thank you. Yes, so uh, Brian, uh, thank you so much for your presentation as well. Uh, the first fascinating thing that I came with when I was looking at your title, where uh, uh, Mea Uli is there, but then there's a, uh, a counseling uh, in the middle. And the, uh, what came in my mind is what uh, when you mention something, even if it's not good to mention it, uh, but by mentioning it, you are uh, revisiting that particular concept and uh, beginning to, to see it, to say it is not uh, right, but we cannot ignore mentioning it. And that's what we are simply doing, uh, the terminology of dehumanizing, but uh, you are still mentioning it. And uh, I think uh, mentioning something it's one of the ways within our communities that uh, brings out the conscious to say, this is a challenge, but we can be able to find life giving to it. And then uh, you are naming it in a very, very unique way through the of songs are text. And dehumanizing, but in the biblical text, it is something beautiful. <laughs> so beginning to see life mm -hmm. on the what has been used as a dehumanizing, but then you you mentioning it from the biblical perspective where there is light at the end of that, uh, that language. And I think mm -hmm. that's what we need in our communities, in our context, to say the same way we are labeled, that this is evil. But mm -hmm. when you look at it in the eyes of God, it is something beautiful and uh, liberating that should be able to make us to progress. Thank you so much.